All right, let's talk about communications and networks. Basically, communication is a process of sharing data programs and information between two or more computers. All right, and the first thing that we're going to talk about in terms of that sharing is connectivity. So connectivity is a concept related to using computer networks to link people and resources. To link people and resources. All right, what are some of those resources that people typically need access to? Well, if we look at it, our communications in terms of what we do when we communicate, we what? We text to a friend, we email to a friend, we video conference with a friend or colleague, and we can also, there's the Amazon smile, all right, have e-commerce with our Amazon friends. Let's talk about the wireless revolution. Okay, the single most dramatic change in connectivity and communication since the development of the internet has been the widespread use of mobile devices like cell phones and tablets with wireless internet connectivity. All right, students, parents, teachers, business folks, and others routinely talk and communicate with these devices. Right, it's estimated that over 4.6 billion cell phones are used worldwide. And these cell phones are basically smartphones. So they connect to the internet and do everything that we've been doing. Let's look at the communication systems uh, in terms of what happens here when we communicate from one person to another. All right. The first thing we do is we what? Use a communication system to send and receive data in terms of using sending and receiving devices <laughs> to get our data. That device could be obviously here a computer. Right? So it could both send and receive. In this example here, we're sending, and this person's receiving. All right, the connection device that we're referring to here is the actual like modem, etc., that were being used. Uh, it could be DSL, it could be cable, etc. Um, and then we have the data transmission specifications, which basically are the rules and procedures that coordinate the sending and receiving devices by precisely defining how the messages will be sent across the communications channel, such as perhaps TCP IP, okay, basically internet rules. And then you have your communications channel itself, is the actual connecting and transmission medium that carries the message. Let's look at some different communication channels. To begin, we have physical communications channels. Well, we have twisted pair. A twisted pair, you have twisted pairs of cables and they're intertwined with one another. That, that intertwining this helps to reduce something, uh, helps to reduce what is called noise. Noise is basically any type of interference. For instance, if you're running cable on the ground and perhaps you had a transformer that just happened to be placed over it later, uh, the EMF, etc., could provide noise to corrupt the data that's moving from one point to another. Next, you have coaxial cable. Basically, it's not intertwined, but it's very much insulated. All right. Um, coaxial cable basically is a, basically a single solid copper core, and it has 80 times all right, the transmission capacity of twisted pair. Next, we have fiber optics. 
They transmit data as pulses of light through tiny tubes of glass or plastic. All right. Compared to coaxial cable, it is lighter, faster, and more reliable at transmitting data. Okay, in other words, you don't have to worry about noise as much. Let's look at some of the wireless features. All right. Wireless features would be Bluetooth. That could be you and your your iPod. All right, connecting to your laptop or to your phone for music. All right, using low frequency waves. All right, but the distance is very short compared to Wi-Fi, which is using also low frequency waves, which allow it to bounce off different things for you to receive it, but obviously has a much wider spectrum. We also have what's known as microwave wireless technology. And microwave wireless technology is basically technology that uses a high frequency transmission and therefore it is line of sight and that goes over very long um, distances. Okay, so uh, if you lived in an area with a lot of hills and no one could come in and put in a fiber optic cable because it's too expensive, then you can use wireless technology such as microwave stations. Right, there's also what's known as WiMAX, which is basically Wi-Fi plus microwave, for those of you who love math. Uh, cities, universities, etc. may be users of WiMAX technology to provide wireless technology to all folks. And then, of course, there's satellite technology. All right, satellite technology is another way of getting information here. And, of course, using satellites. And then, of course, we also have our cellular technology. that most of us use a lot. All right. They communicate using multiple antennas, also known as cell towers that we see built all over the city. <laughs> or perhaps we don't see because sometimes they build it so it blends in with the building, etc. All right. They send and receive data within a relatively small geographic region known as cells. So this could be another tower and this would be like a cell and then which our provider has a plethora of cells all right, to push our information back and forth. Okay let's talk about our connection devices. Okay the device we use to connect um, to the internet uh, that that our PC uses. Okay, um, a modem, short for modular demodulator, is the name of the process of converting digital to analog. Uh, in other words, um, back in the day uh, when we had our phone lines, they actually had uh, analog signals. All right, these analog wavy signals uh, needed to be converted to digital signals. Okay, where uh, to represent the ones and zeros in which a pattern of those ones and zeros uh, could be an A, a B, a lowercase a or a lowercase b, a one, a two, a three, etc. Today, even though most things are digital, uh, we still use the word modem uh, when we're referring to a connection to the internet using a connection device. Uh, the very first 
connection device that we're going to talk about is a DSL modem. Okay, and again, it's just it's just a it's just a a word to describe a connection device, even though it's not modulating, demodulating anymore. All right, a DSL line basically uses standard phone lines to create a high-speed connection directly to your phone's company's offices. All right. These devices are usually external and connect to the system unit using either a USB or an Ethernet port. A cable modem uses the same coaxial cable as your television. Like a DSL modem, a cable modem creates high-speed connections using the system unit's USB or Ethernet port. And that's something I use at home. A wireless modem, also known as a wireless wide area network modem, almost all computers today have a built-in wireless modem. All right. And if you don't, you can always get a wireless adapter card. Okay, that slides into your slot or is able to plug into a USB port. The different services that are out there today, obviously you have your DSL line service from your phone company. Okay, you can have your cable service from your cable provider, which is what I have. Uh, you can have a fiber optic service. All right, some of you who um, may live in newer neighborhoods may have that from AT&T locally. Okay, um, you can have a satellite connection service for some of you who perhaps live in a more rural area, in which uh, people don't have time to put in physical uh, infrastructure. Okay, uh, they'll you can utilize a satellite service, and of course today, all right, even though we've gone in terms of cellular service from 2G to 4G and now with 5G the fifth generation mobile telecommunications technology is the most recent generation and the speeds at which you can have are basically that as the same as home internet Okay, and today many of you, perhaps, even I have a phone, a very inexpensive phone, but with 5G technology in which as the grid of cells is built with 5G technology, um, it can really transform the Internet of things that we've talked about from previous chapters. Next we have data transmission. Uh, our first subcategory of data transmission will fall under bandwidth. There are four categories of bandwidth. Bandwidth basically is just how much information can we send from one location to another. Or how much information or data can we move across a communications channel from one point to another in a given amount of time. All right, that's bandwidth. The first uh, subcategory of bandwidth is what's known as voice band. It's used for standard telephone communications where personal computers with telephone modems and dial-up service use this particular type of bandwidth. The next is a medium band. It's used in specialized leased lines to connect mid-range computers and mainframes as well as to transmit data over long distances. Next, we have what's known as broadband. It's widely used for DSL cable and satellite connections to the internet, where several users can simultaneously use a single broadband connection for high-speed data transfer. We also have what's known as baseband, which is widely used to connect individual computers that are located close to one another. Like broadband, it is able to support high-speed transmissions Unlike broadband, baseband can only carry a single signal at a time. Within data transmissions, we also have what's known as protocols, which are just basically rules on how we communicate 
in a network. The very first protocol we have is known as TCP IP. It's a widely used internet protocol. Its essential features involve identifying sending and receiving devices and breaking information into small parts or packets for transmission across the internet. In other words, we need to know who sends it and who receives it. All right. That information is in data packets, just data, and by a process called packetization, we break up these packets into small pieces and they all may or may not go along the same route to reach the other person over here. How does it know where to go? Well, it knows it's this person's IP address. DNS is very interesting. In this picture here, you can't see it too well, but if you were to type in lonestar.edu, right, a DNS server, a domain name server, through your internet uh, service provider will know that uh, Lone Star's IP address we'll just say it's 65396950 and then take you to that particular IP address so that you can download okay onto your browser our web page Our next category is just basically networking terms. And before we get into our next categories, um, let's just get some terms down. The very first is a node, which is basically any device that's connected to the network. Uh, the next is a client, uh, which could be a node. All right, so a client could be here. These could be clients. And this could be a server. Where the server is providing services and stuff to the clients. Okay. You can have what's known as a directory server, where a directory server is a specialized server that manages resources, such as user accounts for the entire network. You can have a host. A server could be a host, all right, which is any computer system connected to a network that provides access to its resources. So a client could also be a host. You have a router. A router is a node that forwards and routes data packets from one network to another network. So if you were to have, if you were to send information, let's go down here. So you can have computers here and another computer here. And right, you can have a router here that will send information to another area network. You can have a switch, which is a central node that coordinates the flow of data by sending messages directly between sender and receiver nodes. So if this router receives information and it wants to reach this particular computer here, it actually can go to a switch, which will send it directly to a user, uh, rather than sending it to all users if this wasn't a switch and was a hub instead. That's what hubs used to do. It would send the message to all the PCs and then A would say, hey, that's me. I'm listening. Uh, there's also a term called NIC, Network Interface Card. Okay, It's an expansion card located within the system unit that connects your computer to a network. You also have the keyword Network Operating System, which controls and coordinates all the activities of computers and devices on the network. And then we also have a network admin, which is a, basically the person responsible for the network operations and the implementations of new networks. Our next category is network types. 
The very first was what's known as a local area network. As you can see in this picture here, these area here could be our local area network. All right, they're typically less than a mile long in terms of its radius. All right, now we also use home networks. You could uh, probably have a home network at home where multiple computers are sharing a printer at home. There's also a W lane, which is a wireless local area network. Okay, a wireless local area network where all communications pass through the network's centrally located wireless access point, or what's also known as the base station. There's also a personal area network, a PAN. All right, um, devices that are uh, such as your mobile device and the way our text describes it would be things like Bluetooth technology uh, could be considered your personal area network there's other types of personal area networks that can be created uh, through like um, EMT etc uh, like uh, where ambulances and fire fire policemen can all create a, a small personal area network where they can share data as well. Uh, but our book describes it more as stuff like Bluetooth. There's also a MAN. Okay, this is a metropolitan, metropolitan area network which can span a distance up to 100 miles. Uh, typically, this is not within a single organization, uh, but is owned by typically a group of a group of organizations uh, that work together. And then you also have a wide area network which is greater than 100 miles in which all these local area networks can provide a wide area network where the internet is our largest wide area network. Next we have what's known as network architecture. Network architecture describes how a network is arranged and how resources are coordinated and shared. How they're arranged in terms of a subcategory called topologies and then how they're shared, how resources are shared in terms of our subcategory called strategies. In terms of topologies, how they're arranged, etc. You can all you can have a bus topology all right, where um, you simply have a bus and then you have your your nodes lay out like so. All right. You can have a ring topology where your nodes are laid out like that. You can have a star topology. We have a central device, which is your switch. You can have a tree topology. And this is where each device is connected to a central node, either directly or through one or more other devices where the central node is connecting to two or more subordinate nodes that are in turn connected to other subordinate nodes. You have a mesh topology. This is actually a picture of a mesh topology. This is a newer topology where each node is required to have more than one connection to other nodes. And it's usually possible through wireless technologies as well. In terms of strategies, in terms of strategies, how those resources are, are shared, uh, you have what's known as client server, okay, where the 
where you have clients that can access a server to get their resources, or you just have what's known as peer-to-peer. where this or this uh, type of strategy uh, where each of the members have equal authority and can act as both client and server. And last we have a category known as organizational networks. And here, uh, the internet technologies that we talk about here are intranet and extranet. Uh, if you can't see that because it's starting to get small, it's intranet and extranet. And what this picture is here is that these two areas that you see here, this is these are intranets. An intranet basically allows uh, people within an organization to look at things under HR, you know, newsletters, etc. That you would look at the on the internet for, except it's within an enclosed organization. That's the intranet. And then what you see here is you see that these two companies can connect e with each other through what's known as an extranet. So this could be Walmart, and this could be uh, Crest Toothpaste, whoever makes that, Procter Gamble, I'm not sure. And what Crest could do is um, they can have an extranet with Walmart, or Walmart can have an extranet with Crest, to where Crest can see that their inventory is low, and thus Crest will automatically send Walmart, you know, through the distribution center or directly to a store, more toothpaste okay that only crest can have access to no one else can actually have access to it in terms of network security uh, we all we have what uh, something what's known as a firewall uh, which is just basically hardware and software that controls access to a company's intranet and other internal networks Okay, so, um, y you know, there may be like a proxy server here and a proxy server here in this picture that serve as our firewall. Other types of security would be what's known as an intranet, or a, sorry, an intrusion detection system. An intrusion detection system works with firewalls to protect an organization's network. They use sophisticated techniques to analyze all incoming and outgoing network traffic. And these patterns usually can, these patterns that they look at, look that they're looking for uh, could be signals of a network attack so that they can disable those patterns that they see that are uh, negative to the particular company before uh, the payload comes. You also have what's known as a VPN, a virtual private network, that basically allows uh, someone who's remotely connecting in to a company uh, access to the company's resources using public channels to access it, uh, where everything's encrypted and therefore secure. So today, what we talked about under communication networks was we, we started out talking about communications, and basically the general process of moving information from one person to another and everything in between in terms of the actual communication channels, right, the actual physical wires or the wireless, no wires that we use, to the devices that we use to send information over the channels, okay, like the modems, the services, to the data transmission, how fast are they, the bandwidth, and the rules that they use to send information over. We broke out some networking 
terms, some basics for us, so we can have this in our uh, vernacular to use to discuss all of this. The network types from local area networks to wide area networks to their architecture in terms of how the actual computers are laid out. Okay, to the rules in which we dictate how those resources are distributed, whether from client server or peer to peer. And an organizational network in terms of the technologies that it can be used to look at things internally through intra and providing access to limited access to our internal network to others through an extranet and the security that we can use within our organization. And that's it for chapter eight.